Well, uh, friends, my young friends, uh, uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm also, as a dinosaur, I'm just a few months uh, younger than Romila is. <laughs> uh, we came here in the beginning of JNU, and therefore, it was very, very exciting Jaffa, to, to, to be here because JNU was in its formative period, and formative period is always extremely exciting. And therefore, JNU was not merely an institution where we worked and got our salaries from and, and so on and so forth. JNU is something which resides in our hearts, you know, and anything, any, uh, any call from JNU, therefore, uh, one, one, one response in it. I, uh, I, uh, when I was invited here, I began to wonder, you know, uh, lots of doctors, medical doctors around the world, institutions around the world, they are uh, doing very expensive research on uh, age fighting, what is called age fighting, uh, no, aging, age, anti-aging process, you know, on finding an anti-aging treatment. I think the best anti-aging treatment is to come to JNU. <laughs> interact with the students of JNU and nothing sheds away more decades from your, from your age than interaction with JNU students. It's so wonderful. It's so wonderful because, as Romila was uh, pointing out, uh, JNU was meant to be a different university. It was meant to be a different university because it was meant to, as any university should be, but JNU above all, was meant to question received wisdom, was to question was to question what were established truths. Uh, questioning does not mean demolishing. Questioning does not mean, questioning uh, nationalism does not mean becoming anti-national. Questioning patriotism does not mean you become anti, you become anti-patriot. Questioning means trying to understand phenomena, trying to, when you question nationalism, you question in order to understand the, the, the phenomenon of nationalism. And the phenomenon of nationalism is not just one phenomenon. It's a very, very diverse phenomenon. It's a whole host of phenomena, whether it is nationalism or patriotism or anyism that you, that you can talk of. You know, it's a whole host of phenomenon, phenomena, and therefore, Understanding that, questioning that is trying to understand those phenomena, and that's why JNU is 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 JNU promotes so much of questioning. Uh, I please forgive me for a for a for a little biogra autobiographical note. I I think it was 30th or 31st of January 2004, uh, my last working day in JNU, and I was to give my last lecture to my class. Uh, after teaching history for 44 years, 11 years in Delhi University and 33 in JNU, I, I still, believe me, I still prepared my last lecture for three hours before I delivered it, you know, because I knew in JNU, you can't, you just can't go, I've taught it for 40, 40 years, 44 years, you know, in JNU you can't go to class without preparing your lecture, you know. So that's JNU, that's, that's JNU, you know, uh, that's why we love JNU so much, you know. Now, uh, I'll take off uh, from a point that Romila had touched upon, which is very crucial. Uh, by the way, before I go, go to that, uh, Fernand Brodel is one of the finest historians in the world in the 20th century. And one of his last books is called Identity of France in two volumes. That book he opens by asking in the 20th century, he asks, is France one country? Is France one society? Is France one nation? He asks that and he says, France wasn't one country, France wasn't one nation, France wasn't one society in the beginning of the, until the beginning of the 20th century, it began to evolve as a society and as a nation only after the coming of radio and, and television when French became the language of all of France and French uh, nationalism began to be accepted in all of France and yet even in that uh, 20th century there is still a region called Brit Britain. Uh, 
which resents being called French. Those they are, they are French, obviously they speak French. They resent being called French, just as the Scots resent being called British uh, or English. So that nationalism is a is a concept which is still evolving. Even the most advanced nations, you know, it's not merely it's not it's not a settled question in any country in any region of the world. And therefore, it has to be understood. It has to be questioned. It has to be queried all the time. That's our duty to do so. But I'll come back to James Mill, uh, which Romila had to, whom Romila had referred to. James Mill, as she said, and as we all know, in 1818, divided Indian history into three periods, a Hindu period, Muslim period, British period. Prior to that, uh, there was no periodization in Indian history. Uh, the difference between past and present was known naturally, it's known in every society, the difference between, uh, between what has happened, that change that has occurred from the past to the present, that was obviously known. But there was no notion of ancient or medieval, ancient or medieval, or modern or whatever, whatever. There was no notion, not only in India, but anywhere else, except in Europe. In Europe, this tripartite division, which is, which is so familiar now, had come only at the end of the 17th century, in 1688 to be exact. Uh, and then it spread to the rest of the world in the 19th century and early 20th century. In India, it's used for the first time, ancient, medieval, and modern in 1903. But it was used it was in, a, in a different form, Hindu, Muslim, and British period. What is the, what is the implication of this tripartite division, Hindu, Muslim, and British? The implication is that, you know, James Mill was a utilitarian. Uh, he was against all religions. He had very, very great contempt for Islam, but he had even greater contempt for Hinduism. Uh, he, realized, he, he believed that, you know, modern states should function with modern institutions, modern uh, industry, etc., etc. So he had contempt for uh, uh, any earlier forms of uh, state functioning, and therefore he declared earlier forms were Hindu and Muslim, you know. That is to say, nothing else mattered earlier, prior to the coming of British, uh, British rule. Nothing else mattered. All that mattered was whether the religion of the ruler is Hindu or Muslim. That's all. Therefore, uh, James Mill essentialized one notion, namely that of religion, religious identity, one notion. You know, uh, essentialized it. Uh, Kanaya Kumar the other day very, very rightly reminded us, JNU people, we use too much of jargon, which is not intelligible, but essentialized is not much of a jargon. But even so, let me, let me nonetheless, uh, taking advice from him, uh, explain to you a little bit about what does essentialize mean. Essentialize means Kanaya Kumar stands up and says, My name is Kanaya Kumar. So we immediately uh, understand that he is a Hindu, he is a boy, male, uh, that he is also a, 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 a Marxist by uh, persuasion, that he is an activist, that he comes from a certain background, that he, he has certain aspirations, all that becomes irrelevant. All that stand is that he is a Hindu boy. That's about all. Nothing else matters. You know, uh, uh, our friend Umar Khalid has been declaring from housetops that he is he is a, he is an atheist. Uh, in fact, the other day his sister, when he was charged with being sympathetic to Jaish -e Muhammad, his sister said on TV he doesn't bother even about Muhammad himself, not to speak of Jaish -e Muhammad. <laughs> And yet, he is a Muslim, because his name is Muslim, you know. That's what essentialization means, you know. So, reducing all the, all of us have many, 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 many different aspects to our existence, you know. Uh, we are male, male, we are female, we are uh, urban, we are rural, we are poor, we are rich, we are educated, uneducated, this, that, and that, are all kinds of, all kinds of facets, uh, we are, we are, we are, a, we are an ensemble of all kinds of facets. Our existence is not just one identity, you know, it is many, many identities, you know. But all of these identities are reduced to just one, namely the religion, and that to the religion of the ruler, just one. And therefore, Hindu and Muslim period means 
nothing else mattered in the Hindu period except the religion of the ruler. He was he was not he was a, he was a Hindu ruler. That he was a good ruler or a bad ruler, efficient ruler, inefficient ruler. If did he conquer territories? Didn't conquer territories? Did he administer well? Didn't nothing matters, you know. So also Muslim rule. So he essentialized the study of history uh, in 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 these terms of Hindu and Muslim pre-British history, and therefore justification of uh, colonialism. That colonialism brought modernity, modern institutions, etc., to to India. Now uh, it's not as if uh, uh, the 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 the, uh, the notion of Hindu and Muslim was not known earlier. Obviously, it was known earlier. You know, uh, uh, Professor Amila Thapar has written that excellent book, and he has also she's also talked about it a little uh, for a while now, uh, passed before us, where she shows the enormous range of perceptions of the past in early India. Enormous range. There is not one perception of the past. History has has, has seen in many many different ways in, in, in early India. Let me talk of medieval India. In medieval India, uh, history takes a different form from early India. Uh, it, 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 has, it has a very strong Islamic color to it, in the sense that as one uh, historian, Arab historian has written Tarif, Tarif, uh, Tarif Khalidi, uh, Islam brought, not only brought a new religion to the world, but, in, but also a new concept of history. The Arab world uh, was not illiterate. There was poetry, there was arithmetic, there was uh, genealogy, etc., etc. But there was no concept of history there, as as we or as anybody understood it. So Islam brought a new concept of history there, and from there it spread to the to wherever Islam spread. And medieval India also, uh, the historians were writing, were imbued with this idea of. Islam as an aspect of history writing and therefore the era that they used mostly, not all of them, or mostly used was the Hijri era, uh, Islamic Hijri era. So Islam is very, is, Islam is present in history writing in medieval India. But is history writing a branch of theology in medieval India? No, it is not a branch of Islamic theology. Why not? When is history a branch of theology? Let me illustrate this uh, first, and then I'll say why medieval Indian history writing is not a branch of theology. In medieval Europe, where the historians were all uh, church fathers, that was the only literate class in medieval Europe. The rulers were actually generally illiterate, you know, first generation, second generation. It's from the third generation onwards that the ruler began to read and write, you know. But the literate class was really the church fathers. They were the only historians, therefore. Uh, being church fathers, not only did they live in church, uh, precincts of the church and so on and so forth, but their mindset, their thinking is naturally entirely shaped by their religion. In their religion, uh, God is omnipresent, God is omniscient, God knows everything. Whatever has happened in the past, whatever is happening today, what is going to happen tomorrow, God knows all this. You know. In God's mind, everything is, everything is clear, past, present and future is clear. We don't know, but God knows. And therefore, what's happening uh, in history is a manifestation of God's will, divine will. God has willed this this war to take place, this flood to take place, this earthquake to take place, this fellow to accede to the th throne, etc. It's God's will which is uh, manifesting itself in historical events. In medieval, so there are two aspects. One is that all of history is a universal history. There is a whole, history is a whole uh, in which, uh, as I said, God's, God, knows what's, God knows what has happened in the past, present and future in the whole universe. And God's will is manifesting itself, that's a second aspect. In medieval India, neither of these facets occurs in, in, in the history writing. History is a collection of, first history is, uh, history is regional history, within regions is dynastic history, within dynastic is regional history, each reign is a single unit, and when you come to the current sultan, each event becomes an 
I'm sorry, each year becomes a single unit, you know. It's a fantastic reduction from dynastic history to regnal history to annual history, you know. It's a wonderful reduction. And the second aspect is chronology. They're very strict about chronology. Now, uh, but each event is a single individual event. No event is related to any other event. Even their narration is like this. In this year, this event took place. They would describe that event. And another event that took place was this. They would describe that event. There is no connection between one and another event. Each event is a single individual event. Uh, which is contrary to the, the European history where everything is part of a pattern. There is no pattern in history. And the second is that in Euro Europe, medieval Europe, uh, history is, as I uh, emphasized again and again, is a manifestation, manifestation of du divine will, God's will. In medieval India, history is a manifestation of the will of the ruler, or will, or at the best, at best, nature of the ruler. You know, uh, individual will, human will, not divine will. And therefore, you have things like Alauddin Khalji was a very strong ruler and therefore he conquered lots of territory. Firoz Shah Tughlaq was a very weak ruler, he never conquered any territory. Akbar was a very liberal, so therefore he followed a very liberal religious policy. Aurangzeb was very, etc, etc. Et you know this, you must have in your undergraduate studies studied uh, all this weak ruler and strong ruler, uh, liberal ruler, and all of this comes from medieval Indian uh, historiography, you know, the notion of rulers being, rulers will or rulers nature being the determining element of historical. So, so the events of a reign, uh, of any ruler's reign are the manifestation of the ruler's personality or ruler's nature, not God's nature. In that sense, uh, medieval Indian historiography is very fundamentally different from uh, medieval European historiography, and therefore it is not a branch of theology, notwithstanding the influence, the the the, the use of Hijri era and the, and the fact that it owes its origin to Islam in Arabia. Now, once you have uh, human nature as the as the determining element of the events that you are describing then you have a whole range of natures, you know, not, no two persons have the same nature, obviously they don't. I just mentioned to you, you know, Alauddin Khalji is a very strong ruler, Firoz Shah Tughlaq is a very weak ruler, you have all kinds of, a, a historian of the 14th century, Yauddin Barni, even as a theory, he says every man's nature, uh, every man's nature comprises contradictory qualities. It's only a balanced mixture of these uh, contradictory qualities that leads to success and imbalanced mixture leads to failure. And in fact, he says even God's nature con consists contrad of contradictory, contradictory qualities and so on and so forth. And you, those of you remember your uh, chapter on Muhammad bin Tughlaq, Muhammad bin Tughlaq uh, was a mixture of contradictory qualities. That's why he failed as a ruler, you know. So, so but, but you have other rulers, you know, who are very strong, who are very very uh, one or the other, you know. So everyone's nature is different and therefore you have a range of explanations which are given to you by medieval Indian historians. What James Mill does is he reduces all of this range of explanations to one single explanation. The fact that the ruler is a Muslim is all, period. You know, that's all that that, is, that needs to be that needs to be understood. Nothing else needs to be understood. No variation, no change, no no uh, range, nothing, you know, the, the, that the ruler is a Hindu or a Muslim, that's all, you know. And therefore, we began to adopt that periodization and that mode of history writing after in the 19th century and with the good part of the 20th century. We adopted that, you know. How, uh, what, what uh, it does is, I'll give you two examples, what this reduction to, uh, to uh, essentialization does is uh, Annette S. Beveridge uh, 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 translated Babur Nama into English. Excellent translation, absolutely fabulous translation. Now it has been sub superseded by another translator, Taxon, but until for about a hundred years, this was more than a hundred years, it was a standard translation and good translation, very good translation. In the Babur Nama, Babur mentions he went to Ayodhya 
he says that I did these administrative arrangements there, etc., etc. He says I also went to Shikar in Ayodhya. <clears throat> he doesn't mention any Ram temple. He doesn't mention Ram, doesn't mention any temple, doesn't mention demolition of any temple, doesn't mention any uh, construction of a Babri Masjid uh, by him or ordering the construction of Babri Masjid by, or any Masjid by him. There is no, there is no reference to Ram and Ram, Ram temple, Ram, Ram Janam Sthana, Ram, etc., etc. However, in the translation, there is an appendix appended by Mrs. Beveridge, the translator. Uh, appendix, I forget its number. Anyway, it says, in this year, Babar went to Ayodhya. There, he must have come across a very old sacred temple of the Hindus. And as a faithful, for, I'm just paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact words, but this is roughly that, uh, quite exact, more or less uh, nearly that, uh, trans, uh, the, the text, that as a faithful follower, follower of the faith, uh, as a follower of the faith that he belonged to, he must have destroyed that temple. You know? <laughs> Now, this is what follows from essentialization, you know. Because Babur is a Muslim, therefore he must have done all this, you know. That he did all that, there is no evidence that he shows, that even she shows, you know. But he must have done all that. You know? But let me take up a bigger example than this. You see, uh, <clears throat> as a, as, as a essentially Muslim ruler, or rulers, uh, what would be their primary duty in when they are ruling over India, such a vast territory as India, with a massive non-Muslim population. Their primary duty would be two, duties would be two, inter interrelated. First would, would, duty would be to, to convert these non-Muslims to Islam. That would, be, that would be expected of a very faithful follower of Islam, Muslim, essential Muslim, etc., etc., you know. And B, to impose uh, the only one jurisprudence over the entire population, namely the Shariat. That's required, naturally. You know, it follows from that, you know. Now, let us look at the, let us look at the process of conversions in Islam. I don't want to go into many details, but very briefly. Let's look at the question of conversions in Islam. Let me say that the Muslim population in the Indian subcontinent before partition, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh together, is the largest population in the whole world. It, now it is uh, divided because it's divided, so it's Indian, Indonesian is the largest, but if you put it together, it's the largest Muslim population in the whole world, isn't it? And yet there is not a single book on how do these conversions take place the largest population and we don't know how do these conversions take place in India. Why is there is no book? You know, there is no book because, not because historians haven't thought of writing a book on this, you know. There is no Pakistan in Bangladesh and South India in, in Malabar area of Kerala. Isn't it? Uh, that's where the Muslim majority population rests. Uh, Malabar, the, 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 the so-called Muslim uh, rulers never reached there. Their, 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 their regime, their territory stopped short of Kerala, uh, Andhra, uh, Karnataka. That's where, that's the maximum they reached. You. Kerala they never reached. So they have no role play, to play in the conversion of people, in, uh, of Malayalis to Islam. Kashmir had turned to uh, Islam long before Akbar invaded Kashmir uh, in the 16th century, 1573, I think. Uh, uh, and Kashmir had uh, turned to, there are two books on Kashmir, uh, uh, both of them suggest that a major force of conversion to Islam there was Nand Rishi, who is, the Nand Rishi is a Sanskrit word, but he's actually this, uh, this uh, saint, Sufi saint who is buried in Ch Charare Sharif, he's known as Nand Rishi. His persuasiveness is one of the main reasons, not the state, but his persuasion is one of the main reasons. What is now Pakistan? The west part of Pakistan, uh, the frontier area, is always has always been a disturbed area. This was constantly under attack from the Mongols, from here, from there, from the tribes, and so on and so forth. You know, and the and the role or uh, rule of the so-called Muslim rulers. We don't. We historians don't use these terms anymore. James Mill did, but we don't. But nonetheless, I'm using it to make my point. 
the rule of the Muslim rulers in India, in, in, in that part was always shaky, always never very firm. It was always episodic. And in what is now East Bengal, there were local Muslim dynasties, but no, no, virtually no rule, uh, no, no, no rule from uh, Agra or Delhi or whatever. It was always contested, you know, always. So therefore, uh, and in the mainland of the Muslim rule, Bihar, UP, Delhi, East Punjab, the Muslim population never exceed, in, in if it was about 16%, 15, 16% 16 in 1941, it must have been much lower than that obviously earlier, 7, 8%, 10%, 12%, whatever. In the heartland of the Muslim empire, the Muslim population, where they were so powerful, Mughal empire was the most powerful empire in its time, you know, and yet the Muslim population never exceeded more than 12 or 14% in the heartland of their empire. You know. Therefore, the argument that the Muslim state was converting people to Islam falls flat on its face, on its face if you look at the demographic distribution of the Muslim population in India. I'm not suggesting that the state had no hand in it. The state also had, had, it, hand, uh, had its hand in it. In fact, <laughs> uh, you, uh, my Muslim friends may not be very pleased to hear this, but nonetheless, as a historian, let me nonetheless say that the state converted people to Islam as a kind of punishment. You know? uh, that is to say, if you commit a crime against the state, and the you know only only uh, punishment for crime is you know beheading, uh, but the state, the ruler is kind, or ruler has considers past services or usefulness of the man. He says, "Okay, I'll not kill you, but if you convert to Islam, you know." <laughs> so it's a second level punishment being given to them, you know. Uh, uh, so also, by the way, Hajj, you know, sending people to Hajj is the second lot biggest biggest crime, biggest punishment you can give them. You know? Whenever the state is unhappy with some, but some Muslim uh, noble, they send him to Hajj, you know, to Hajj. But anyway, so that, you know, uh, so it's not as if state did not have a hand in it, you know. Uh, but uh, the point I'm making is, and the point that many historians have made is that it's the, uh, from which I started, why is there is no book? The, the, there is no book because there is no data, and there is no data because the process of conversion is a so extremely lengthy, it extends over centuries, two or three centuries, and b, it, ha it occurs over in the hands of, at the hands of so many agencies that there is not one agency which is responsible for, you know, if there was one agency, let the, let, let's say the state, if they convert lakhs of people here or thousands of people there, some historian or the other, uh, great, his, great theological historians like uh, Mullah, uh, there is a historian of Akbar called Mullah Abdul Qadir Badani. He is a Mullah himself. He was a Mullah, he was an Imam of Wednesday prayers in Akbar's court. He was a very, a very, uh, what shall I say, zealous uh, Mullah himself. He writes his book, Muntakhav Tawarih. He would have said, what a great ruler he was, so and so was. He converted thousands of Kafirs to Islam. Not a word in his three volumes. You know. There are other historians uh, like Bhim Sen, Hindu historians like Bhim Sen, or Sudan Rai Bhandari and so on and so forth. Not a word about conversion so in them. You know. Nobody is right. Why are they not writing? Because the state is converting some individual there, some individual there, etc., etc. State is not engaging in a massive conversion which would have got into record either by way of praise or by way of condemnation. You know. It would have got into record, but it doesn't. You know. so, so therefore, uh, Therefore, there is no data, you know, uh, there is no data because it's happening so slowly, so slowly over long stretches of time and through so many different agencies and for so many different reasons, so many different reasons that, uh, that, they, that it is, does, it's not a, it's not a one-go affair, you know, where you, where, where, where it will get into record, you know, it doesn't get into record. That's why the historians don't, uh, can't write a book on that that very major theme of history, namely conversion of masses. So that, so, so uh, this is uh, this is the history of uh, the so-called Muslim rule in India. But what is a picture you get from James Mill's essentialization of Muslim? Muslims are Muslims, so they will be there. That's what they would be doing all the time. They would be converting people all the time. You know. Uh, so you get a distorted picture of history. You get 
you 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 lose a whole range of explanations of history you get one explanation which also is a false explanation which also is historically in terms of historical data is a is an incorrect uh, in, 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 in uh, inference you know. therefore you get a uh, get a you, you get a bad kind of history following from this you know uh, singular kind of history you know just one monolithic kind of history, singular kind of history. Now this lasted till about the 1950s, uh, uh, this kind of history. I'm, I unfortunately, or which, which, fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, this is also the kind of division that our historians, Indian historians had adopted. They also adopted this as Romila has already pointed out, adopted this. But you know, things began to change in the late 1950s, early 60s. Uh, I happen to be one of the worst, belong to that fortunate generation, I think, where I was a student at Delhi University, undergraduate and postgraduate in the second half of the 1950s, uh, as BA and MA. Uh, I studied that kind of history that I'm now describing, uh, Hindu and Muslim and so on and so forth. It was called medieval India, but actually it was Hindu and Muslim and so on and so forth, that kind of history. Suddenly there was a wave of change, you know. Suddenly you stopped, uh, you, 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 you started talking of uh, class rather than community. You know, you start, community as the category of analysis was central to uh, that kind of history. That was suddenly replaced by a new category called class which had nothing to do with, you don't have Hindu peasantry and Muslim peasantry and so on and so forth, you know. You have peasantry, you see. Uh, and therefore, a new explanation, D.D. Koshambi, Irfan Habib, R.S. Sharmat, gave a, started a new kind of, uh, completely landscape, historical landscape changed, you know, up in the 19, late 1950s, early 60s. You know. And that colonial kind of, colonial legacy that we had inherited, that began to give way one after another. In the 1980s, late 1980s, 90s, a fabulous range of themes, a fascinating range of themes is emerging, you know, absolutely breathtaking range of themes has, is emerging, you know, uh, th themes like history of the notions of time, for example, history of the notions of space, for example, history of interpersonal relationships, for example, history of the household, for example, history of gender, history of ecology, history of, history of uh, the natures of states, and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, uh, and, and therefore, a, 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 new, a, a fascinating new world has opened from the 19, late 1980s, 90s onwards, and then in the 21st century, where, where uh, quite clearly old texts, uh, chronicles and texts and so on, they wouldn't do, they can't give you the data, you know. You have to go dif to different sources altogether. New sources began to open, apart from texts and uh, uh, chronicles and uh, archaeology, new texts, uh, folklore, uh, uh, folk songs, vernacular literature, there are some fabulous books recently on vernacular literature as history, not as sources of history, but they also encompass a concept of history, a notion of history in themselves, you know. Marvelous books are being written recently. So a new world is opening up, you know. So we have left, we have left colonial history far, far behind in the last 50 years, very far behind very, very far behind, uh, completely abrogated. And I must say that the British historians themselves, under the influence of historians of India, they themselves have given up this kind of colonial kind of uh, historical writing, you know. They are themselves giving it up very fast, you know. But, that's the question. But, the RSS and the BJP wants to, wants us to give up all this, forget about all this. Go back to James Mill, go back to history as Hindu and Muslim, that's all. No other, nothing else matters except Hindu and Muslim, that's all. The, 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 nature, the religion, the ruler is all that matters. And therefore, Aurangzeb was a bad ruler because it, you ask, what, is, what, what, what do you know of Aurangzeb? Aurangzeb was a bad ruler. He,